pretty good once I figured out. I'm excited about this series. Yes, yes. I think we have some good information. Well, you definitely do. Yeah. Yeah. I heard the last one was really good as well. Uh, the last one, which one? Mm -hmm. So give it one more minute. I'm a very punctual person, so um, and we'll start right at six o'clock. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen for the PowerPoint. Okay. <clears throat> thanks, Sam. And thanks for getting that over to um, Samantha. I, I guess it was Kelly maybe that sent it earlier today, but thank you very much for coordinating that. Absolutely. All right, so let us get started. Um, I want to welcome everybody tonight to the Family Engagement Series 2020. Um, tonight's presenters are Carson High School um, social workers and school mental health workers. Um, if you're one of my students, you probably know these guys from school. Um, they also came into my classroom and did the suicide prevention earlier on in September. So. I think if we were in school, you would kind of know what they look like more so than on the Zoom video. So um, I appreciate them agreeing to present and um, coming up with this PowerPoint. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Partnership Carson City for hosting this tonight um, and running the Zoom conference. I will be moderating the um, presentation. So if you have any questions, down at the bottom, there's a chat box you can, um, click on the chat and type it in, um, or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can ask a question if you feel like that's what you wanna do. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our um, mental health workers and that is Eric Tedro, Rob Oliver, uh, Olivas, sorry, we say that wrong, Alejandra Ayala and Kelly Edmondson. Awesome. Thank you so much, Partnership Carson City and Miss Bean for hosting this family engagement event. We're really thr thrilled to be here with all of you. And we're going to be talking about coping strategies through difficult times like now, right? So this is kind of an umbrella title for lots of little things that we're going to be diving into. We'll be talking about trauma, we'll be talking about some neuroscience, um, genetics, and all the other factors that impact our ability to develop skills that help us cope with adversity and then ultimately strengthen resilience. So throughout this whole presentation, you're gonna hear a lot about resilience because that's kind of what we, we honed in on. Um, the presentation is divided into four sections because there's four of us and we figured, hey, why not? So we'll have time for questions at the end and Ms. Bean already explained the chat box where you can raise your hand if it seems like the best time to ask the question is right in that moment, then by all means, raise your hand and let us know. Um, and uh, otherwise, what we should have like, you know, 10 minutes at the end to really get into any comments or feedback and questions. Um, we're gonna start with a short video clip and then Eric Tedro will lead us into the presentation. So we can go to the next slide and go ahead and hit play. Maybe. <laughs> Can you still see my screen? Yeah. Okay. I think I just have to do the sound. Key. Key. Can you hear it? Key. Yeah. Key. Okay. Keys. Also, we go. skip on. You know when there's nothing left to do but to fight? With everything you've got to get back up. There's a word for it. Resilience.
and that word comes down to such a simple test. Not much involved, but in the moments that matter most, it's everything. You and a mirror looking into your own eyes and realizing there's nowhere else to go but out. And being ready for what that takes. It's a single decision. The same decision you'll need to make every day. Get up. Get up. Get up. It's what brings people back when an injury makes it look to everyone else that all is lost. But it's not. It's what gets someone to write letter after letter after letter, looking for a job because they know all they need is a start. It's what causes someone to keep moving straight forward even when the start of their journey should have knocked them off track. You and Amir, same decision every day. Because the thing is that comebacks mean the damage is already done. Comebacks only happen after things get hard. It happened, and only you know how dark it gets. Resilience and grit, these aren't pretty words. They mean something much more to those who know them well. These words have scars. They symbolize the battle. But they are also the gateway to something so special. It's what it means to lose eight elections, be in bed for six months after a nervous breakdown, then to get up and do what it takes to enter the books of history. It's the power behind getting rejected 12 times before smashing almost every record and every ceiling imaginable. Resilience. That's the word left when the storms keep coming. When things go from bad to worse, every reason to stop trying. The moment we all get humbled by at some point, sometimes more than once. There are times for dreams, and sometimes there is only time for the reality of now. Picking up one foot, then the other. Starting to move forward step by step. Tears and frustration, another step. Hurt and sadness, another step. Shaking off what was, you just keep going. It's the light that finally breaks after the darkest of nights. In the moment that matters, you and Amir. Same decision every day. Knowing it's going to be long. Knowing there is no other way. That is resilience. That was a good video. <laughs> well, good sound. <laughs> the video wasn't working? Yeah. The video didn't play, but the sound did. Oh no, I'm sorry guys. That's okay, I, I'll post it. I'll post it for everybody. Okay, okay. Uh, sorry. Perfect, and um, now we can go to the next slide and it looks like someone has written <laughs> Yeah, what is happening? I'm sorry. Let's go back into that. That was so bizarre. <clears throat> sorry, everyone. So yeah, Miss oh, Bean will post the link um, there we go. for the video. Perfect. And then um, we'll just keep on trucking. So Eric is going to present next. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I uh, don't currently see the, the slideshow on my screen. But, uh, <laughs> Let me fix it again. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Let's see. From current slide. Are we good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, awesome. And, and again, we, we appreciate you being here this evening. Uh, my name is Eric Tedrow, and mental resilience is often described as a psychological edge that helps people endure challenges, overcome adversity, and achieve more success. 
Um, there are many common myths about mental toughness that can influence your beliefs about where it comes from and your willingness to experience growth from it. Um, I'll be honest, I pull these myths and facts for mental resiliency um, surrounding sports and serving in the military. Um, but when you think about it, um, these terms can be interchangeable when talking about anything from that test you have tomorrow to your relationships, uh, to depression, uh, trauma, or even pandemics. And the following statements are either myths or facts. And by the end of the presentation, you should know the answers. Next slide. Okay. Uh, number one, uh, mental resilience is something you either have or you don't. Number two, uh, mental resilience is just about your mind. Uh, number three, only I can build mental resilience by myself. Four, being mentally resilient is about ignoring my emotions. Okay, five, resilient people will never fail. Okay, so everyone, um, we will come back to these at the end. Can you go back? Oh, sorry. That's good. Um, so, so everyone, uh, we will come back to these at the end and uh, take it from someone who necessarily didn't have the best childhood, was a mediocre student, joined the U.S. Army in the late 90s, experienced 9-11-2001 while, while on active duty, wow. spent 14 months in Korea, and completed college later in life, and all not necessarily good or bad experiences, but just life, and now COVID-19. And we will get through this too. Um, next up is Alejandra. Hello, everyone. So um, we're going to go ahead and go to the next slide, and I'm going to go ahead and jump right into talking about trauma. Um, so with that, um, Trauma is defined as a psychological, emotional response to an event or an experience that is deeply distressing or disturbing. Um, in other words, it is the result of an experience, a situation, or something that, you know, um, that we've gone through that has caused an overwhelming amount of stress, impacting the ability to cope with it. Um, so we're going to be looking more into some of the common responses to, to trauma. Um, you know, they, they arise from, from those experiences. Next. So um, just, uh, we're gonna start with some of the physical responses, um, which there is a, a short list here, but the, I mean, there's more than that, um, which can include having uh, an upset stomach, um, sweating, yeah. having issues with sleeping, um, shakiness, um, and with that also going into the traumatic events, it's important to know that um, th there can be a, a great var variety of them, um, including natural disasters, um, earthquakes, flooding, um, the loss of a loved one, or even moving to a different country, to a different state, just a different location than what we're used to and leaving everything um, that we've known or that's familiar to us behind. Um, and it is important to note that everyone responds differently to these experiences and the response can be influenced by protective factors or lack of protective factors um, that will be covered later on throughout the presentation. Next. So um, the other um, emotion, it's, we're going to jump into emotional responses. And again, this is uh, only a few of them, doesn't cover all of them, but they include feeling hopeless, um, feeling nervous. Um, it could be feeling jumpy, um, easily startled, being constantly alert, um, having disturbing dreams um, when we, we, can't, we might not be able to, to sleep or we might feel restless. Um, with that, with the concentration, it can impact us on work, on school, on our relationships with others. Um, and with what we're facing right now with COVID-19, we are all being impacted in one way or another. Um, there's some of us that um, the impact is at a greater extent than others. Um, there's families that are currently facing financial difficulties, um, illness, um, they've experienced the loss of a loved one. 
And due to the limitations and what's expected of us right now with social distancing, um, you know, um, not being able to do large <laughs> gatherings, we're having to find ways to adapt um, in, in how do we respond or how are we there for one another. Um, with that, there, uh, there's no slides, but there's also some um, responses psychological um, that can include intrusive thoughts, worrying, blame, or self-judgment. Um, and there are some behavioral responses that we might notice as well that it could include avoidance of those things that might remind us of those experiences that we've had and isolation. And at many times it is due to be to feeling unsafe after experiencing you know, those traumatic events. Um, so trauma can drastically affect the body and mind, but I also want to focus on what are some of the positive responses um, that can result af after we faced a traumatic experience? So next, um, we're gonna be looking into thriving after a, a traumatic event. Um, and there's been some research that has pointed to, to three main areas of growth that people noticed after, after having such experiences. Um, and the first one is um, growth in understanding of the self, which is noticing a greater sense of personal growth and of personal strength. So just like the quote here, um, it is paying attention to and taking care of ourselves. That includes our body, our health, um, and just being aware of what, what is it that is going on with us. So just as an example, um, a close friend of mine and I were talking and she's sharing how during these times of isolation, it has helped her in taking time to develop new hobbies. She's doing some gardening and, and things around the house. Um, she's trying to eat healthier, um, staying active, and just doing things that usually she would be putting off due to time limits, um, due to the usual busy schedule. Um, we all have, you know, uh, things that we, we normally have our routine, such as going to school, work, sports, um, any other extracurricular activities that we might be involved in um, and responsibilities that we have at home. So it might prevent us from really focusing on this, which is giving that time for ourselves and focusing on that self-care piece. So next, um, the second area of growth that um, the research has found, it's just um, in the, having a greater understanding of others and with that, including social growth. So with this is um, creating a deeper relationships um, and connections with, with people or reconnecting with people that we haven't talked to or heard from in a while um, and just strengthening those bonds with families, friends, and, and those around us. Um, so with that too, another example is um, one of my cousins mentioned um, her, her kids are, are young and she had to leave them you know, when they were a few months old to go back to work. And this has allowed her um, time to just spend more time with them, get to know the personality of, of her kids a bit more. And it's not only the, the quantity of time, so not how much time she's spending with them, but the quality of it as well. Um, and I think that, again, we do have some limitations of how could we do that for ourselves um, with social gathering limitations and such, but it's about how can we adapt to stay connected? How do we utilize, you know, our Zoom, just like right now, social media, other platforms, um, to find ways that we can be of support for one another? And going to the next one. And the third area of growth um, that has been identified through some of this research has been a greater understanding of the world. So a greater appreciation of life. Um, and that can include being mindful, um, cherishing time, or, or viewing things for, from a different lens. So focusing on the little things um, that at other times, you know, might be taken for granted. Um, are we looking into positive things in our day-to-day? -day, or are we focusing more on, you know, the negatives or everything that's going wrong instead of, you know, trying to find what is something, identifying one thing that we can focus on our day that you know, that we can appreciate. Um, so just when, when you guys get a chance, I would encourage you to think, you know, think about your own individual situations. What are some things that you guys have noticed about yourselves um, 
you know, that, that you're doing differently that you are doing now and didn't do before or that you have picked up from, you know, you haven't done in a while, or if you haven't noticed those changes, what are some areas that you would like to focus on or, or some ways that you can view your individual situation differently? Um, and just with that to ponder, um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Rob Olivas. Thank you, Alejandra. I'm glad I remembered to unmute. Usually I keep it, keep it muted and talk for a few minutes before my colleagues remind me. So, yeah. <laughs> but let me start by, uh, let me start by thanking everyone for having us tonight and inviting uh -huh. us. To... Can we hear? Yep, you're good. All right. Let me start by thanking everybody for uh, basically inviting us into their homes or um, their workplace, wherever they might be, might be viewing this. We certainly appreciate it. Um, it means a lot to us. And I want to kind of talk a little, I want to add maybe a little bit to what Alejandra was talking about. I, the tail part of her um, section really resonated with me. I think uh, mm -hmm. trauma is one of those things that you hear a lot about nowadays, you know, trauma-informed care. Um, they're talking about, you know, teachers should be trained in trauma-informed care. Um, librarians should be trained in trauma-informed care. Anyone that's dealing with um, our youth uh, would benefit from having at least a little bit of knowledge about trauma, um, which makes sense because unfortunately, a lot of people have, in one way or another, uh, been subjected to adverse events that, you know, could have caused some lasting trauma in their life. So I think it's as, you know, if you're an adult, you're an educator, if you work around children, I think it's a responsible thing. It would be great if, if we all knew a little bit about trauma. And also, um, one other thing that resonated, um, I like that Alejandro talked about just thriving, thriving in the face of... Um, adversity if you've been impacted by a traumatic event how um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're you know you're going to be affected like that for the rest of your life there's there's um, you know there are methods there are techniques there's a lot of research being done to um, help people out of that to help them learn how to calm their nervous system um, I heard a uh, I don't know if it was a webinar or, or what I listened to but um, they were talking about you know, when working with um, youth that had been exposed to trauma, um, basically kind of sterilizing the environment and removing all the obstacles for those children so they don't ever have to be triggered. That's kind of a buzzword as well. So they don't ever have to be triggered. But when it comes to resiliency, which is what we're talking a lot about, um, we got to find that sweet spot. You know, children, you know, children and adults in order to heal and build resiliency, um, need to be challenged. They need to be challenged, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. They need to be challenged with a supportive, um, in a supportive environment and with, with a healthy support system. So thank you for that, Alejandra. I really kind of got off on a, ta a tangent there. So um, <laughs> we can go to the next slide, uh, Samantha. Ooh, that's moving slow. Um, what is resilience? I guess that's, that's kind of what we want to know. It's, uh, I tried to shorten the definition down to um, the ability to adapt and respond to adversity. <clears throat> we all, we all kind of know what adaptation is. Um, when you're talking about resilience, it's, us it's usually used in the, po or if you use the term adapt, it's usually used in the positive. How do we respond effectively? Um, how do we learn from it? How do we not be, uh, how do we not be sidelined or just curl up in a ball on our bed? I mean, when that video wouldn't start earlier, I had a strong urge to just leave the room and, you know, go lay in my bed, but that wouldn't have been very good. So, um, that's, that's what happens when we talk about adaptation and we could, you know, miss, um, miss Kelly will talk a little bit about maladaptation when it comes to alcohol, drug use, some behavioral things. Um, but uh, when we talk about resilience, we're talking about adaptation, positive adaptation, responding positively, learning from the situation. Um, the situ and when I talk about the situation, I'm talking about adversity. So adversity, again, um, oh, you can go ahead and go back, Samantha. Oh, oh, wait. Adversity <laughs> means... <laughs> Why is it being so crazy? Sorry. <laughs> Can't stop it. I know. So one thing, um, 
you know, when, when we were, when I was putting the, uh, my slides together and doing a little bit of reading, uh, one thing that struck me um, about adversity, adversity is not, it's not something that's um, stable across to everybody. So what might be crippling to one person may not be crippling to another person. So adversity can take on a different flavor from individual to individual. Um, an example that I thought of was if you're a student, and I know we have some, um, gratefully have some students here with us. Um, if you're a student who enjoys the online learning environment and may enjoy um, being at home, maybe, maybe, you know, you don't, you're not out and about, you're not going to the, you know, you're not going to the movies all the time. You're not hanging out with a bunch of friends. Maybe you have one or two good friends and you just, you know, you prefer just to be, you know, kind of alone and learning, learning an online environment. Maybe this COVID crisis is not going to affect you as bad as somebody who just loves going to school and, 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 you know, just can't live without five days a week um, at school. So that's one thing to keep in mind when it comes to, when we talk about adversity, there's a, there's a difference in how it affects people. Um, and that's also important to keep in mind when we're, you know, when we're helping or treating or working with um, people who have, who have been subjected to adversity. So next slide. So I'll just, I'll just throw out, a, um, and Ms. Kelly will um, talk a little bit more about benefits of resilience. Um, but some of the individual benefits of, of being resilient, possessing resilience, however you want to inter however you want to uh, say it. Um, the one thing which to me is really big is, is resilient people report, people who test high in resilience report lower rates of depression. So that's, that's a benefit. Um, Students who test high in resilience report, um, or not report, but they show improved academic performance. So that's definitely a benefit. Uh, increased feelings of positive well-being, that could be the, in, or the uh, opposite of lower rates of depression. Um, one thing that I think um, is extremely important with our youth and anybody in general is um, high, resili high resilience correlates with uh, reduced risk-taking behaviors such as alcohol, drug, um, drug use, um, things like that. And also, finally, um, people who have higher rates of resilience or test higher in resilience have increased physical health and lower mortality rates. So um, I just kind of wanted to throw a few things out there and, and you know, to show that it's, it's good to work on our resilience. So next slide. All right, here's, uh, here's a big question that's asked, and I guess not necessarily with just resilience, but with um, anything that people study. Um, is resilience uh, a matter of nature or nurture? In other words, are we born with resilience? Are we born resilient? Or is it something that we develop over time? The answer to that is, is, is both. Um, what they're finding is that we're born with genes that um, with resilience genes, but our behavior and our course and our environment and our um, path in life, uh, our psychological outlook um, is going to determine, we're getting drawn on again, is going to determine whether, um, whether those genes get turned on. And that's what's called uh, epigenetics. So you might have a good example, I think, with epigenetics is that. Uh, the alcoholism gene, right? That's one you hear a lot about. Um, people think if you, if your father, grandfather, mother, grandmother are alcoholics, you're destined to be um, afflicted with that um, substance use disorder or alcohol use disorder. Not necessarily the case because imagine if you never, um, if you may have that gene, but imagine if you were never exposed to alcohol, very unlikely that you're going to become an alcoholic or a drug addict. So. That in a nutshell is kind of what epigenetics is. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about, real quick, about the sympathetic nervous system. Did I lose my slide? <laughs> I'm gonna go back into it. I have no idea what's happening with that writing. I'm so sorry, that's bizarre. That's all right. We're resilient. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you talk, uh, 
the sympathetic nervous system is um, something that I think I think bears mentioning uh, when we're talking about the stress response and anxiety and things like that and resilience. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system is basically uh, that part of our nervous system that becomes activated when we are subjected to uh, a stressful event. So. And again, back to what I talked about adversity, stressful event could be different from one person to another, but the great example that's always used is um, if you're, you know, years, you know, thousands of years ago, if you're, you know, coming out of your cave and you see a tiger, um, your sympathetic nervous system kicks in. It increases your heart rate and your lungs, increases your lung capacity, pumps more blood to your, your muscles, basically preparing you to run from that tiger and or fight the tiger. So that's the, that's the in a nutshell, the sympathetic nervous system. Um, the problem, it's very adaptive and it's helped us survive for, for many, many years. But what's happened more currently is the sympathetic nervous system is, gets out of whack, right? So we fail a test. Um, all of a sudden we have that same response that we might've had if we were faced with a tiger. And it, that is a, an abnormal response to failing the test. So just something I wanted to throw out there. And also it's something interesting about the sympathetic nervous system. I was watching a, uh, a nature show the other day and there was a zebra getting chased by a couple of lions or tigers. I can't remember exactly what they were. But the amazing thing was they chased that, they chased that zebra for probably a minute all over, yeah. all over. And then when they were done chasing them, the zebra was eating and grazing within a half an, you know, within a half a minute. I mean, it was probably 30 seconds and his sympathetic nervous system had calmed down. So that's kind of the goal. He had a, he or she had a, a, a highly functional sympathetic nervous system. And it's kind of the same thing with resilient people. Um, so next slide. Maybe. Somebody oh, please, no. please yeah. There we go. See, this is perfect. Our resilience is being tested tonight. <laughs> so then the question, the question begs, um, now that we know a little bit about uh, resilience, the stress response, things, uh, trauma, things like that, the question um, that I would like to know is, how do we build and strengthen resilience? And I'm gonna touch, um, I'm gonna give a brief overview of two, um, two domains. I'm gonna talk about the psychological domain, psychological domain, I'm sorry, and the uh, um, family and social domain, um, and and Miss Kelly will go a little bit deeper into these um, with some more um, practical techniques on how to develop them. But I just want to touch on the psychological domain and how you can how you can build and strengthen resilience psychologically. So, cognitive restructuring. You hear a lot about cognitive behavioral therapy, um, things like that. But cognitive restructuring restructuring is basically changing how you view an event and practicing doing that. So I saw a bumper sticker the other day, I thought it was, it was perfect. It said, don't believe everything you think. And when it comes to cognitive structuring, that's, that's exactly what they're talking about. So question your thinking. Um, if you don't have evidence of something, ask yourself, is that true before you get upset about it and, and respond accordingly. So aversion work, that's another one you can do um, psychologically. And that's basically, um, kind of exposing yourself to let's just say you let's just say you're afraid of snakes right so maybe you start with a little gardener snake you hold that for a while then you move up to a little bigger snake and and what you're doing is exposing your sympathetic nervous system to stressful events in small doses and eventually you're holding a, a, a large uh, I almost said rattlesnake hopefully not eventually you're holding a large uh, boa constrictor um, mindfulness techniques something that's uh, been popular for years now and with good reason because the research shows that mindfulness techniques like meditation and yoga are extremely effective at lowering your um, sympathetic nervous system. Your, your ability to respond effectively to stress. When you, when you are stressed, your sympathetic nervous system like the zebra calms down uh, just the way it's supposed to. Um, and again, mindfulness techniques take practice, practice, practice. So these are things that are, they do take practice, but they're well worth it. So next slide.
so finally, I want to, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, social, the social and family aspect of, of building resilience um, component, I should say. As you go through life, um, research, again, research shows that um, individuals with a strong social, not necessarily large, but a strong, healthy, supportive, active social network um, are more resilient. And I think that's because if you have good friends, then they're going to help you through tough times. And then you build confidence and you know that you can get through tough times. Um, the importance and value of family support, I can't overstate that. Um, and I'm talking about from you know early childhood development all the way through adolescence. Uh, it's, again, research shows that children who were raised in healthy, supportive, nurturing, caring um, families have higher, re higher um, test higher in resilience. So, and I, you know, I shouldn't, uh, it's one of those things where I, I could go into a long explanation, but basically it boils down to the same thing with social support. If you have a, a family that's gonna help you through difficult times, gonna trust you, um, and gonna help you build confidence or efficacy, um, you're going to move forward in life with that confidence and that efficacy and you're, you know, you're going to have more resilience and more, you know, more success. So, um, I'm not sure if I have another slide. Let's see. I don't. So it looks like we're, I'm going to hand you all off to Miss Kelly. Right. Thank you, Rob and Alejandra and Eric. Um, I'm learning as we go. It's really fun to sit with all of you and, um, you know, hear, hear more about this topic. Um, so where do we go from here? You know, we've, we've learned a bunch of valuable information um, about how the body responds to traumatic and stressful events. We've learned that within each of us, we have the capacity to learn and grow from these experiences, which over time helps us build resilience. And as my colleagues have explained, the entire body works in tandem. So our thoughts, our feelings, sensations, and behaviors are always interacting. And although it can seem like at times we're not in control, we actually have a lot. However, it does take skills. Um, and I kind of think, you know, so skills and practice for sure, and we're going to get into that. But before we can even get into skills and practice, we really need to dive into increasing our awareness. So we can go to the next slide. All right, so this is a great um, visual tool. It's the window of tolerance, and there's lots of different examples out there on the internet. Um, what this does is it helps us assess what ar arousal zone we're in at any given moment in response to our thoughts, our feelings, sensations, and events. And you can see at the top, there's the hyper, which if you, you know, if you have a little brother or a little sister and they're running around the house and you think, oh, they're so hyper, well, that's exactly it. It means too much, right? Too much energy, unable to integrate because there's too much going on. That's when you might be in the fight flight response. And then at the bottom, you can see the hypo arousal zone, which is too little arousal to integrate. And so it's almost the immobilization, right? You're, you're um, numb, you're passive, uh, you might feel shut down. So there's both sensations, thoughts, and feelings that are associated with each one of these windows. And then right in the middle is kind of the sweet spot that Rob's been talking about, that optimal arousal zone, that building resilience and having the skills really allows us to spend more time in that space than bumping out into the other spaces. Now, the reality is nobody lives in the window of tolerance all the time. I don't even think the Dalai Lama does. Maybe him. I don't know. But you know, really we are, and sometimes it saves our lives, right? If we are in the window of tolerance, and a boa constrictor is about to wrap itself around my body, Rob, I <laughs> wanna fight that boa constrictor off, right? So I need a surge of hyper arousal in order to get that off of me. Um, so the reality is, you, you know, you strive for that middle space and you recognize that you're not always gonna be there. And so with COVID-19 happening, you know, many of our day-to-day -day routines have been disrupted. I would say 100% of our day-to-day -day routines with each other have been disrupted. 
Um, and as a result, you know, additional stressors have emerged that maybe are just like frosting on top of the already stressors that some of us had in our life. And it can feel pretty overwhelming. So maybe you were in that window of tolerance and then this happened and you find yourself in either hyper or hypo a lot of the time. So I want you to just think about the past few weeks and really just kind of have an honest moment with yourself and think, where have I spent most of the time? Some of you are going to be in hyper, some are you going to be in hypo, some of you are going to mostly be in that calm, cool, collected and connected space. And then once you've identified where you've mostly been, think about what contributed to that. So what thoughts, what feelings, what circumstances, um, people, places, sensations, all of that contributes to you being in that arousal zone. So just kind of have that moment with yourself where you increase that awareness and then we can start moving in to skill building on the next slide. So we are building our roadmap to resilience. Um, here's the cool thing about this stuff, super smart, way smarter people than me and thoughtful people at really awesome institutions have been studying trauma responses and how to heal and grow from, from them for years. Um, like Rob said, it's a really important subject and that's why so much time, energy and funding is invested into really figuring out how do we recover from these things, learn and grow, because we know we can. Um, so the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania has conducted really extensive research on the subject of building resilience, and they've identified six core competencies. And so they are self-awareness, self-regulation, mental agility, strengths of character, connection, and optimism. And then these are just the competency categories that are like the umbrella. Underneath them, they've identified 21 uh, separate skills that really fall under each one of them. We'll get into some of them, but if you're really interested in research or this topic, you can go onto their website and the link is here and just read all of the research they've been collecting for, for years. So next slide. All right. So we're going to go with core competency of connection and others have already talked about the importance of this. So prioritizing relationships always, but especially during this time. Um, they, we know that um, resilient folks, um, folks that report high levels of resiliency, report um, really healthy relationships, really healthy connections in their life. So yes, we've had to adapt our relationships these past few months and not being able to spend time with each other in person and with our friends has been a struggle for a lot of us. And you can still find ways, like Alejandra said, of prioritizing your connections. And um, you know, it just takes a little bit of creativity and flexibility, which I'll come back to as well. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people who fill your gas tank up. So looking at the second one of connecting with empathetic and understanding people can remind you that you're not alone in the midst of difficulties. And then focusing on finding and investing in trustworthy relationships and genuine compassionate individuals who validate your feelings. So this is the thing I'm, I'm often struck with at school when I have students come into my office and they talk about their friends and they might be having some confusion around like, why is this person treating me this way? Or why are they saying th these things about me? And just kind of working with them to identify, you know, is this a person in your life who fills your gas tank up? or is draining you dry. And if you find yourself feeling depleted and icky after spending time with someone, not just once, you know, cause we all have bad days, but if it's like a theme where you're like, whenever I'm with Kelly, she's just so negative and she can't say anything nice about me. And I just like, I don't really even know like why I'm friends with her. You know, she makes me feel bad about myself. Then you have to ask yourself, are they really a healthy connection to invest any more time in? So just consider that, that it's not so much the amount of people we surround ourselves with, but the quality of those relationships and what they, how they feed our soul. And then the last thing is helping others. So the act of helping others been, has been widely studied and shown to have really positive impacts on our sense of purpose, our connection to others, and our sense of worth. And just remember that within that helping others, you want to go into it with the mindset of being genuine and altruistic, 
versus expecting something in return for your good deed. So um, you also don't want to force yourself on others. You know, if someone says like, no thanks, you want to be like, but I need to help you, right? Um, that becomes kind of about you fulfilling your own needs and not necessarily helping that other person and respecting their boundaries. So next slide. All right, so core competency of self-awareness. Um, so tuning into the body. So to slow down to tune in. And there's a really wonderful book called The Body Keeps the Score. If you've ever heard of it, it's a, a, a scientist by the name of Basil van der Kolk. And he's written uh, extensively on the subject of trauma and how it uh, changes the brain and then how you heal trauma by using um, really uh, body focused uh, therapies as well as integrating thoughts and feelings. And um, it is kind of an intense book if you have any trauma history or you just don't want to hear about other people's trauma, then I would not recommend reading it. But if you are interested in this subject, it's, um, it's just a wonderful book. So consider that. We really do have to kind of slow down to tune in though. Um, and then let yourself feel all the feels. So my daughter <laughs> tells me this of just like, feel all the feels, right? And I love that because it's so simple to remind ourselves that no emotions are bad emotions, that they hold information and we can experience them without judgment. Um, so we get to be curious, which is the next one. We get to be curious about what we're feeling. And Albert Einstein, who we know is an exceptionally bright man um, and made many discoveries, a quote of his is actually, I have no special talents. I am only passionately curious, which I love. Because when you think about his discoveries, it really was his curiosity about the universe and our existence that kept fueling his fire for um, um, continuing to you know, evolve the field of physics. And so I want to go into, and maybe I didn't do this with the tip on the last one, but the tip on the side. So taking a moment to focus on your breath and ask yourself when I'm feeling right now in my body, and is there something I need, and what's within my control and that I can, that I can do to help regulate myself? Um, we want to try and avoid actions that will take you away from feeling what you feel. So like what Rob said, um, sometimes coping strategies can become unhealthy and habitual in a way that doesn't really help you in the long term. So the things I'm thinking about are drugs, alcohol, excessive spending uh, of money, disordered eating, self-injury. Those are all super effective short term at taking you out of the present moment and avoiding feeling what you actually feel. And they might also likely um, change the way that you, the thoughts that you're having. What these behaviors do is they actually rob you from the opportunity to build resilience and they can become addictive and a way of dissociating from reality. So we just wanna keep a check on that of avoiding um, spending you know, your time in those unhealthy strategies and finding alternatives that are going to help fuel long-term resilience instead of avoidance. So next slide. All right, so core competency of self-regulation. So the first one is practice mindfulness. Um, John Kabat-Zinn, who is the creator of mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, defines mindfulness as um, the awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, in the service of self-understanding and wisdom. So what I want you to take away from this is that you don't have to go sign up to take yoga tomorrow. That many actions and practices can be done mindfully. Brushing your teeth, cooking dinner, walking your dog, talking to your friends can be done mindfully. And the idea is that there's no one way to approach it. It is truly a practice that you can find your own way through. The next is exercise. And there's so much information out there. Again, if you're into research, just dive in on the positive benefits on mood with just 15 to 20 minutes of exercise every day. So exercise literally changes the type and the amount of chemicals that are being released from your brain and going into your body. And several studies have shown that exercise is just as effective and sometimes more than medication in reducing symptoms of mild to moderate depression and anxiety. 
And then lastly, um, this touches on what Rob has mentioned, which is gradual exposure, exposure versus avoidance. So just see if you can expose yourself sometimes to things that make you a little bit uncomfortable. I'm not ready to have a boa con constrictor wrap around my body, but um, I kind of like snakes. I just don't want, I just don't want to have a huge snake with me, but this strengthens your ability to self-regulate, whereas avoidance prevents growth. So the way I like to think about this is um, I have like a mild, mild social anxiety, which is I don't particularly like going to places where like there's social events where I don't know anyone in the room. And it's not that I can't be by myself or that I don't know what to talk about with people. It's just kind of not my favorite thing to do. And so a way that I could approach that to build some resilience in that area would be to visualize myself walking into a room with multiple people that I don't know and just kind of feeling what that feels like, experiencing the thoughts that might come up as I imagine myself in that room. And I don't even need to try it to build resilience. I can just visualize it to start that relationship with building resilience around social anxiety. What I like to remind people about is that anxiety feeds on avoidance. So if you are avoiding things, you are feeding that monster and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So just remember that if I am avoiding it, I am feeding the monster. We don't want you to like, you know, face your fears in a way that are dangerous for your, your physical well-being, but to just consider, could I maybe shift my relationship with this experience? Um, and the tip for this category is search for apps on YouTube or channels, um, apps and YouTube channels that provide guided meditations or mindfulness, um, exercises, journaling prompts. There's tons out there. These are just a few of them, like Calm, 10% Happier. I bet you know more than I do. And then don't be afraid to try new things. What works for one person doesn't always work for another. Next slide. All right. Why am I not changing slides? Can you see it on my end? I can't, yes, okay, I see okay. it. Yes, okay. so mental, mental agility um, is the core competency. So keeping things in perspective. So how you think can play a significant part in how you feel and how resilient you are when you're faced with obstacles. So you may not be able to change a highly stressful event, but you can change how you interpret and respond to it. And that's that reframe that Rob was talking about. Um, like we can't change COVID-19, it's happening, but we can change the way we interpret and respond to it. And try and keep things in perspective and look at stuff from all angles, not just one. So if you feel yourself kind of stuck and just like narrowing, be like, can I step out of this? Or maybe you can talk to someone else. Like, how do you see it? It's different than how I see it. And just try and be flexible in that, in that sense. Um, seek opportunities for self-discovery. So people often find that they've grown in some respect as a result of a struggle in their life. Like most of the people I know, that's applicable to. It, I know it's for myself. When I think back on my life, it's not the stuff that came super easy that I learned a bunch about myself from. It's the stuff that was kind of tough. Um, and I bet that as you look back on your life, you'll find those moments do factor into who you are today and your sense of empowerment and perspective. Um, and then, Gosh, accepting change, this is really hard. It's so simple, two words, but it's really hard. Change happens. Y'all, if you didn't know, it happens. So the second rule of physics, known as the law of vibration, tells us that change is inevitable. All is in motion. It is vibrating at its own unique frequency. All is constantly moving, changing, growing, evolving, expanding, or contracting. So we need to learn how to accept change as part of all of our lives. And then lastly, um, make creativity and flexibility your friend, be curious, be creative, be flexible in your thoughts, and learn from your past. You've already accomplished so much in your life, and you have so much ahead of you. Just remind yourself where you've been, and find strength and ask yourself what you've learned from those experiences. So the tip is, whenever possible, focus on the things that you can change versus the things you can't. And then be mindful of your tunnel vision or that narrowing that I'm talking about and getting so committed to one way of thinking and seeing things that you miss out on learning from others. And remember that those always and nevers are really, really rare. 
So if you find yourself saying, oh, he always, or I'm never, it's probably not the case. So see if you can switch your relationship to those words and find something else to explain it because it's pretty rare that things are always or never. All right. And next slide. Strength of character is, in a nutshell, knowing what you believe and living by those beliefs. So if you aren't sure what your most important values are, so leaning into your values and your morals, there are some really neat questionnaires out there that can help you determine for free what's most important to you, and then you can explore the why. Because I think the why is super cool. So did you learn it from your culture? Did you learn it from your friends? Did you learn it from your family? Or are you finding yourself having different values than anyone else in your community? And that's okay too. And how did you form those? And there's both real values and then there's aspirational values. And when we live within our real values and our morals, we have a greater sense of purpose, efficacy, and confidence. Aspirational values are great to be aware of too because it might not be how you're living your life now, but it might be where you want to be living your life. And you just have to build that bridge and figure out what's, what's happening now versus where do I want to be. Um, for some people, you know, um, being honest with yourself and others is one of their core values and it's one of their top values and for others, not so much. So we know that people who are honest and genuine and authentic with themselves tend to have more satisfying relationships they tend to have more self-awareness and confidence than those who might be masking their true self. And I think it's, um, if you don't think honesty is important to you, I would just ask you to consider how do you feel and what do you think when people are dishonest to you? And if it bothers you, then it's, there's a good chance that honesty and authenticity is one of your core values. So just something to kind of take and think about. So lastly, identifying and setting goals. Um, it's important to set goals for yourself and actually take steps towards achieving those goals. Um, so over on the tip side, there's just an example, and you can Google this as well, that goals should always be SMART. So they're specific, they're measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And then lastly, goals should always be achievable. Otherwise, you set yourself up for disappointment, which just chips away at our motivation. It just depletes us. Um, and I think the really important thing that I want to take away from this slide is strength of character is built over a lifelong journey. It is not a one-time quick event. So if you feel like, man, I don't know anything about my values or morals or like, I have no idea, that's okay because it's going to evolve and you're going to just start this relationship with curiosity and this is a journey that you'll be on the rest of your life. Next slide. The last one is optimism. So it's really, really hard to be positive when life is not going your way. And this might be one of those moments in your life. An optimistic outlook empowers you to expect that good things will happen to you eventually. They might not be happening right now, but they will eventually. And optimism is not pretending that bad things don't happen or avoiding feelings of sadness or fear or anger, optimism is holding hope that things are gonna improve in time. So it's the characteristic of seeing the future in the best possible light and viewing yourself as having some control in achieving these good things. And all of this fits into the category of embracing healthy thoughts versus expecting the worst. And then lastly, expressing more gratitude. So when we feel and we express more gratitude for others, we're more likely to easily experience positive emotions. And there's research to back that up too. And so the tip for this is to keep a gratitude journal on paper or maybe use an app um, and just start creating a daily habit of one thing that you're grateful for. And maybe you already do this and maybe you have some really cool ideas that I haven't even thought of like collages or whatever. Uh, maybe you have a YouTube channel, and if you do, on gratefulness, like, send it to me. I want to follow you. Yeah. So um, another idea would be, like, a jar where you put just one thing in every day that you're grateful for, and at the end of the week, you dump it on your bed, and you read everything, and just, like, check in with yourself and be like, how does that feel? Or at the end of a month or a year, imagine that, like, your bed would just be covered in paper, and you just read all of these fantastic things that you're so grateful for. It would be so satisfying. Try and get through at least one day. Uh, a week with a glass half full approach versus a glass half empty. 
And that, I think, is the end of my part. So we're going to go back to Eric to revisit myths and facts. Hey, hey everybody. Um, uh, you go to the next slide. Okay, so if you've all if you've all already figured out, you know all the statements we said at the beginning, they're all myths. So for myth number one, uh, mental resilience is something you either have or you don't. And the fact is, you're actually born with mental resiliency, and you can learn to develop it even more at any age. Maturity and pers perspective grow as you get older, but when it comes to learning skills, there are advantages to starting early. Therefore, having mentors that we look up to can help us build that resiliency. Next slide. All right, myth number two, mental resilience is just about your mind. But the fact is your body and mind are connected and they influence each other. It's important to learn skills that optimize all factors that impact your stress levels. For example, you might be prone to, build, to beating yourself up all the time and need to focus on changing how you talk to yourself. But if your pounding heart is throwing you off your game, you can, you can learn these strategies we have brought to you today to manage your body's responses. Next. Okay, myth number three, only I can build mental resilience by myself. The fact is your family, friends, teammates, coaches, teachers, and other influential people in your life can enable your growth and development. As we have learned this evening, having just one trusting relationship can boost your resilience when things get tough. This may grow even more when you look to those around you for support, encouragement, and critical feedback. There are people in your lives that can help with this and you just need to find them. Next slide. Being mentally resilient is about ignoring your emotions. But in fact, being resilient is about identifying, managing, and finding helpful and constructive ways to express your feelings and to help guide those emotions towards positive outcomes. While learning some of those coping strategies for tough emotions that are throwing you off track and getting in the way of your relationships. Next slide. Resilient people never fail. Failure is essential to building resiliency, and if you never experience failure, you may not have the chance to learn and grow from it. Resilient people fail all of the time. They're not afraid of it. What also sets them apart is how they handle themselves when things don't turn out as planned. They seek help, try new solutions, and they even work harder. How many times did it take Thomas Edison to invent the light bulb? Again, thank you for your time and participation with us tonight. Next slide. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Kelly for questions and comments. All right. I don't know if Eric, uh, Ms. Bean, has anyone written any questions or comments? No. No one has written any um, questions in the chat box. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, your presentation was incredible. Um, and I know Alejandra and Kelly and Eric and Rob all have given us so many options and so many things to try um, in order to build our resilience. But I want um, my students and their parents to know that if you don't try some of these techniques, Resilience just doesn't happen. Like you have to actually put some effort into it and try, even if it's just one, one technique or one tip that you take from this and try it. And then the next day, try something else. And like Kelly said, um, it's not a one size fits all. Like you'll find what works for you. And I hope that you can take something from this. Um, a, a lot of what Kelly and Rob, you were saying is repeated from what Bridget was talking about last week about um, coping and um, being resilient. So I love that it's a repetition. So yes, thank you, Miss Bean. And if you want to go to the last slide, Sam, um, 
our contact information is up here and we'd love to hear from you. So if you're a little shy or like, oh, I just want to process this and um, ask a question later, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, we are working through to the end of the school year. We are available to you for individual support. If you email us, we can set up Zooms or Meets. Um, we can talk by phone. You can schedule sessions with us. Um, or if you're just curious and you want some resources, um, feel free to reach out anytime. And if I can also add, Kelly, um, I know that there was like a lot of amazing content in this too. And a lot of it, I feel like I even have to like process on my own and like, wow, that was really great. Um, but if there's anything that you guys want to revisit or you're like, that was a really great quote or anything like that, we do upload all of these to the Partnership Carson City YouTube page. So if you just um, Google Partnership Carson City on YouTube, you'll see our page and all of these are uploaded for a later time. So if you ever just want to revisit any of the previous ones or especially this one as well, um, those will be uploaded as well. Good point. And I will also put it in my Google Classroom so that all my students have access to all of these tips and tricks. Um, you presented an overwhelming amount, <laughs> but it's always good because you're going to find something, like you said, that works for you. So um, having options is always a good thing and um, understanding that it's baby steps. Like it's something that you have to continue to practice over and over and over and you just can't give in and give up. You have to practice being building resilience so it looks like somebody threw out a uh, question a couple of oh, to go yeah i don't want to miss that one we have so the first question is is it possible to not have high resilience and be able to still have good grades and most that high resiliency have so i guess they're asking can you not have high resilience resiliency skills but still have good grades Yeah, I, I can I can start with that and anyone else can chime in. So the thing is like you already have resilience. Yeah, so anyone who is here right now is resilient. We have survived this and we will survive tomorrow and, and we are born with a certain amount and we cultivate uh, resilience as we learn new skills and, um, and coping strategies for life difficulties. So yeah, like, what you may have figured out is like, I can channel my energy into school and get high grades. And then I might struggle in a different area that um, we talked about, like social relationships or family stuff, and maybe feel like, oh, that's a part of my life that I want to cultivate more resilience in, but I've got this academic thing down. Um, so absolutely, it, it is not a cookie cutter um, like, oh, people that are resilient look like this, right? We all are going to move towards different areas of our life where we feel really confident in. And um, and then the, the trick is to take areas that we might be, uh, I guess, less confident in and try and invest a little bit more energy into that. Because our tendency as human beings is to do the stuff, keep doing the stuff we're already good at and kind of like not really look at the stuff that's kind of scary and hard. And um, so maybe just like take some of that energy that you have towards your good grades and see if you can apply some of those skills in another area of your life that you want to be more resilient in. But that's just my two cents. Anyone yeah. else? Yeah, Rachel, I just wanted to add, um, I think it was Rob that was talking about psychological mindfulness and social and family resilience. So grades doesn't all, always transfer over to being resilient or being smart or intelligent. Um, there's so many other aspects of resiliency that can be worked on. <laughs> yeah, and I would also, um, if I can, I want to add to that a little bit. I would argue that if you do have good grades and you're a good student, chances are, um, at least in that domain, you have a certain um, level of resilience. So um, confidence is, a, is a, um, an indicator of people who have resilience. And I would imagine that if you are a good student, you're likely confident in your ability to succeed scholastically. So yeah, I would argue that, um, yeah, I think there are different domains of resilience. So I, I don't think it's, 
a one size fits all. I would argue that um, people who are, you know, good students and are willing to put in the work are also um, resilient to a certain extent. So I don't think it's a one or the other. I don't think it's a and or so. Yeah. It looks like there's a comment too saying thank you. This is some really great information. We actually started saying three things we're grateful for at the dinner table. Aww. Since I <laughs> since I wasn't consistent with the jar idea, even if it's some goofy, it it brought laughter and also let them know even the small things count. I think that's awesome. Um and yeah, I think you just get to play around with it and you know the fact that you are acknowledging, like just feeling that gratitude and then saying it, it's one thing to feel it and think it, right? That even has powerful action in and of itself, but then to actually say it to the other person and share it is fantastic. And laughter is, is very healing. So that's great. So all of you that are my students and you're still on here, I just wanted to tell you that when we explored the dimensions of wellness, um, in January at the beginning of the year one of those dimensions was spiritual and you guys were all hung up on what is spiritual and I'm like it's not religion it's it's your soul and I think this resilience um, presentation speaks to that like it's your values and what you believe and how you react to things that's your spiritual dimension of wellness so I think this is this information really covers that and I appreciate um, you guys hitting on hitting on that so thank you well i don't see any other comments but um upon conclusion of tonight's presentation i would like to thank um carson high school mental health professionals rob alejandra kelly and eric for a very thorough and um informational presentation it was awesome um, I would also like to thank Samantha at Partnership Carson City for hosting and putting this Zoom conference together. And also the Department of Public Behavioral Services, Substance Abuse Primary Prevention. Um, our next meeting will be next Thursday, May 21st at 6 p.m. via Zoom, like tonight. And the presenter will be Leticia Servin, who is our Carson High School Latino coordinator. Um, it will be in Spanish, and her topic will be how to finish the semester strong um, while in remote learning due to COVID-19. So hopefully um, you um, are interested in coming to that. Um, Leticia is a really good presenter, and she has a lot of good information that could help um, the Latino population. So I see a lot of thank yous. Um, I will post this presentation in Google Classroom, like I said, for everybody to access as a resource. Um, yeah, so with that, I think I will close down the meeting. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks everyone.